just had just the most wonderful fellowship all weekend, and and I'm glad to be a part of this church family. It's an awesome place to be, <laughs> praise God. And uh, Brett told me in the early service with my jacket that I look dapper. So for those of you that don't think so, you can go to another church. Praise God. Aren't you glad for the family of God? Amen. Well, this morning, the resurrection of Jesus is among the four greatest events in the history of the world. The birth of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the crucifixion of Jesus, among them as well. So Jesus is the most significant person who's ever lived in the history of the world. There's more songs that have been sung about Jesus, more paintings have been painted of Jesus, more books written regarding Jesus than anyone that's ever lived in the history of the world. <coughs> and on this day, Resurrection Sunday, a few billion people around the planet are on earth gathering together as we are right here to celebrate the fact that He is risen, that He is Lord, that He is Savior, that He is Christ, that He is King. And there's no one thing that draws us here. It's the entirety of the message of Jesus, His love, His sacrifice, His life. And there is no one who has transformed the world more like Jesus. Our two greatest holidays are centered around Jesus. Our the Resurrection Sunday, which is today, and of course, Christmas, the day that we celebrate about his birth. Our calendar, uh, B.C., is, is, is before Christ. He was born around that area in A.D., Anno Domini, which means uh, the year of our Lord. So the story of Jesus echoes throughout our world today, even though separated by more than 2,000 years and attempts to crush those who carry the message, it still lives on. I have behind me a picture of uh, the Golgotha, the mountain where which it is supposed that Jesus and the thieves were crucified. And as you look at the mountain, it's called the hill, the st hill of stone is called uh, the place of the skull. And you can kind of see the picture of a skull, a face of a skull in there. And this was Golgotha. This was the place where Jesus was uh, supposedly crucified. And, and when someone famous dies, we memorialize them, don't we? We set up a headstone or we set up a monument, and when someone famous dies, we memorialize their grave. And, and this is true in Seattle. We have the famous Bruce Lee right here. Uh, you can go visit Bruce Lee's grave right here. Famous karate guy. More famous than me, that's for sure. Now, also Jimi Hendrix. We got a picture of Jimi Hendrix right there, and uh, Shane wishes he was half as good as Jimi Hendrix. Uh, but we can memorialize Jimi Hendrix. Did it work in the second service as well? It did, yes. Praise God. And, of course, our very own great from the Seattle area, Kurt Cobain. And you can go to these places where there's memorials set up. And when a religious leader dies, their grave is actually more enshrined. There are four major religions based on a person and not just a system of ideas. The first one is Judaism, based upon Abraham. And today, if you visit Hebron, you'll notice it's an enormous tribute, a memorial, a worship site built over his dead entombed body. Similarly, in Buddhism, the, the Buddha is buried in India, and over his tomb, you'll find uh, an enormous place of worship where there are people uh, pilgrimage every year. Also, Islam is founded by Muhammad, who is buried in Medina. And and his grave is marked with an enormous location of worship. So if you look at Abraham's grave, you'll find it. Buddha's grave, you will find it. You'll, you'll find Muhammad's grave. He's still lying there. You'll find Hare Krishna, where he is buried. You'll find Joseph Smith, where he is buried. You'll find Jimi Hendrix, Kurt Cobain, Bruce Lee, still in their graves. But you will not find Jesus in his. You see, Christianity is also founded by a man, Jesus Christ. But what is curious, though is that the tomb is not only enshrined, not enshrined, it's not really known. Nobody really has any idea where the most famous man in the history of the world was ever buried. This is because he rose from the grave. No one really knows where this place is. Tourists come to uh, Jerusalem all the time, and they visit what is essentially a, a museum. It's a place where a tomb did reside, and someone perhaps was buried, but it is empty, so they take you to where they, they show you what perhaps it was like it was where Jesus was buried, but they will tell you, and the archaeologists 
who oversee the site, in fact, will say that Jesus was likely not buried there, but they have no idea. Why? Because he rose from death. His body isn't there, and unlike every other world religion, there is no evidence that he is there. Jesus fulfilled not only that in the physical sense, he fulfilled so many other things as well. He fulfilled messianic prophecies about him that were written in the Old Testament long before he came. I think that we understand, like we celebrated this last week as we received communion, wonderful time of worship. It was so powerful, and, and Pete brought the word about on Good Friday as we celebrated Jesus' death, we announced his death. And that's important to a Christian, that Jesus died from sin. 1 Peter 2.23, Scripture says, When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. For by his wounds, we have been, you have been healed. That word rapha there is in the Hebrew, but in the Greek it means something else as well. It means salvation as well. That our, our taking from sins is, is, is only because Jesus has taken our sin from us. Every person on the planet Earth has an obligation to their sin. We have to either justify it, we have to cover it up, or we have to make excuses for it. But i got to tell you, friends, that Jesus died for your sin. He took your sin and my sin to the cross. And a lot of people do a lot of things with their sin. They, they just don't deal with it because they don't think it's important. Uh, or they, they push it aside. They cover it up with other things, drugs and alcohol or, or relationships with people. They do all kinds of things to disguise or cover the pain from their sin. When every single person on planet Earth is just looking for that peace that Jesus has to offer because he covered and he died because of that sin. Not only that, the Bible has uh, so many prophecies concerning Jesus before he even came to be, before his uh, birth and resurrection and life, and it has a lot of prophecies pertaining to his crucifixion and death, ascension to heaven, and so on as well. In fact, I just want to reiterate 15 of them real quickly. In Psalm 41, verse 9, 1,000 years before Jesus, the scripture says, that he would be betrayed by a close friend. Now, we all know that that was Jesus. It says, even my close friend whom I trusted, who shared my bread, has lifted his heel against me. And this was fulfilled in Luke chapter 20, verse 47. Number two, he was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. And Judas did this as well in Zechariah chapter 11, 600 years before Jesus. It says, I told them if they think best to give me the payment, it's not to eat them. So they paid 50 pieces of silver fulfilled in Matthew chapter 26. Thirdly, Christ Jesus would be scourged and he would be spit on. Isaiah 50 and verse 6, 800 years before Jesus, uh, it says, I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheek to those who pulled my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Jesus of Nazareth, born in Bethlehem, was the one that fulfilled this prophecy. It was fulfilled in Matthew 26 and 27. Fourthly, the, the blood money paid for Christ's refusal to buy a potter's field. If you, if you remember in Zechariah, the 800 years earlier, in, in chapter 11, it was fulfilled in Matthew 27. Fifth, that Christ would be crucified with greed. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, he was, he was, he was put to death with the transgressors. Fulfilled in Matthew 20, chapter 27. Sixth, Christ would be given vinegar to drink, and he was on the cross. Psalm 69, 21, they put gall in my feet and gave me vinegar for my thirst. Fulfilled in Matthew 27, Jesus said he thirsts, and they took the stick and they, they stuck the spear in his plunge with vinegar in it, and it was disgusting. It was horrible. It was, it was what they had used, what they used typically in those circumstances to clean the, the bile off of the body. Seventh, Christ would suffer piercing of hands and feet. Psalm 23, once again, 1,000 years before Jesus, it says, Dogs have surrounded me, a band of evil men has besieged me. They have pierced my hands and feet. Fulfilled in, in Mark chapter 15 and John 19, verse 20. His garments would be, be divided and gambled for as King Paul. Psalm 23 tells, tells us this, that the, the soldiers at the foot of the cross, they gambled, they cast lots for Jesus to be rolled. It was fulfilled in Luke chapter 23. Ninth, it, he would be surrounded and ridiculed by his enemies. Psalm 22, again, a thousand years before, it says, All those who mocked me, they hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusted the Lord, they said. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he 
delights in them a thousand years before. And what do we hear the Pharisees saying in front of the cross? These very same things. He saved others. Let him save himself. It's recorded in the New Testament. Matthew 27 and Mark 15. Number 10, he would, he would commend his spirit to the Father. Psalm 31 verse 5 says, In your hands I commit my spirit. Be truthful and God says, The God of truth. And then he prays the very prayer that Jesus prayed when he died in Luke chapter 22. 11, his bones would not be broken. Exodus chapter 12. 1,500 years before Jesus. Numbers chapter 9 and verse 12. Psalm 34. Um, the Bible says he protected all his bones. Not one of them would be broken. All of these prophecies were fulfilled in John chapter 19. And the reason for this is they were hung on the cross. And a couple of years ago, your man is probably talking about the, the, the physical the physical doctrine part of this where, where the, they were pushed down and their bum cavity was compressed and they were hanging, they, they, they pushed up on their feet to, to be able to get a breath again. And so the soldiers came by and they broke the legs of those being crucified so they would literally suffocate. And they didn't break the legs of Jesus because he was already dead. And just to make sure, they put a pier, they pierced his side all the way to his heart where blood and water flowed out of the wound. The Bible says, and then number 12, he would be forsaken by God, Psalm 22. And, um, and he cried that prayer on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right over Psalm 22, verse 1, he would be buried with the rich in Isaiah 52, 9. It was fulfilled in Matthew chapter 27. If you recall, he, he went to be buried with a rich man's tomb. He would ascend to heaven in, in, in number 14. And, and Psalm 24, lift up your head, for gave you good today, ancient doors, that, let, that you would let the king of glory in. Who is this King of Glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Number 15, he would be seated at God's right hand. Psalm 110, verse 1, the Bible says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Fulfilled Matthew chapter 22 and Ephesians chapter 10. Now this is amazing. 15 different things. Just 15. That's statistically amazing that one person would fulfill all of those things to a T. And here we have 15 things fulfilled concerning the death and resurrection. But i got to tell you something amazing. It's much more amazing than just these 15 things. In fact, the, the probability of Jesus being born in Bethlehem is 1 in 280,000. Jesus riding in Jerusalem on a donkey was 1 in 100. Man. Being betrayed by a close friend, what are the odds? 1 in 1,000. From that time and that era, to fulfill the kind of things that he was, he would fulfill those things. And the likelihood this morning of a meteorite landing on your house is 180 followed by 12 zeros. 12 zeros. Being killed by lightning in a year is 1 in 2 million. So if I were just to take 8 of these 15 prophecies about Jesus, and take their probability factor, as someone has already done the research, it would be 10, just 8 of them, followed by 28 zeros. Just 8 of them. But Jesus didn't do just 8. He didn't do just 15. He fulfilled 323 prophecies concerning the Messiah. You see, Jesus was the Christ, the promised one, the Son of God, the one who would come and rescue, the one who would come and save, the one who would come and redeem. And there's some screams for your heart right there. You see, Jesus not only did that, he fulfilled it, and he puts it right in the face of the culture, right in the face of the world and its ideology. Jesus escaped his grave for two reasons to redeem the day of death. At the time of Jesus, he had been persecuted for 700 years by the Babylonians, the Syrians, the and now they're persecuted by the Greeks and Romans. Then he too grew scattered and lived as captive among his nation. But we only see Jews today. You don't see Hittites, Perizzites, Ammonites, Assyrians. We don't see Babylonians. We don't see uh, Persians and other people, other ites. And the reason is because they're, they got captured. They intermarried. They, they lost their national identity. But this didn't happen to Jews because of Jews that made Jews. The social structure that gave them their national identity were unbelievably important to them. And the Jews would pass these structures down from one generation to another. Morally, 
mean, it would it would straight reiterate them. They were books written so that their children would be able to understand them and, and celebrate them. And they would celebrate them in the synagogues every Sabbath. They would have meetings and stand forth with this ritual because they knew that if they didn't, there would just be no Jews left. And Jesus came five very significant things. Number one, he came to animal sacrifice. You see, they had been taught since Abraham and Moses that they needed to offer animal sacrifices on a yearly basis to atone for their sins. But all of a sudden, after the death of this great man that he was part of, Jesus came and said, these are no longer offered sacrifices to me. Secondly, they kept the law. I said, said Jesus just emphasized obeying laws. He got his sons to point to the standard and set for them when they came into the picture and how they kept them in their eyes so that you wouldn't separate them from other nations, which is who it was. But within a short time after Jesus' death and Jesus' resurrection, Jews were beginning to say to this day that you don't become an upstanding member among the community by obeying the law. Jesus tried to explain to them why that was so. Third, they're keeping the Sabbath. Well, Jesus scrupulously really kept the Sabbath. In fact, you couldn't walk with too much weight in your pocket for a certain distance. It was, it was kind of uh, crazy some of the rules that Jesus was having. But, but by not doing except for making sure they made this on Saturday, the Sabbath, the day of rest, the, the day that God sent the break on it. This was one of the law, and this guaranteed the salvation of their whole family to be in right standing as, as a nation. But shortly after Jesus' death, uh, uh, this 1,500-year tradition stopped within a decade. These Christians now worshipped on Sunday. Why? Because it was the first day of the week, the day that Jesus rose from the grave. 1,500-year tradition. Imagine that. Jewish ensconced religious tradition. All of a sudden, within a decade, now what's happening? Monotheism. They believed in monotheism, only one God. Well, Christians teach a form of monotheism. We, we believe the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all equally God. In fact, we find this reiterated throughout Scripture. The Father is the will of God. The Son is the word of God. The Holy Spirit is the work or the ways of God. And they all have the same uh, directive. They all have the same will. They all have the same per, uh, different purposes of ministering them, but they are all God. They're all unique persons within the Trinity. And this radically changed from what the Jews had believed up to that point. They would, they would consider it the height of heresy. For someone that could be called God and man at the same time. And yet the Jews began to worship within the first 20 years. The decade, this decade, they began to worship Jesus as God. President Messiah, the fifth thing, uh, these Christians pictured Jesus uh, or the Messiah, the Christ would come and he would be a great political leader and he would destroy the Roman armies and he was different. He came and fulfilled prophecies concerning sin and so how can we possibly explain why in a short period of time, not just one Jew, but an entire community of at least 10,000 in, in this early time were willing to give up these five key things that were so significant to their social life, to their theology for so many centuries. They gave it up simply because Jesus had risen from the dead. Changes that the world had never seen to that point. And here comes Jesus, and he changes everything and, and turns their world upside down. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that awesome? That not only from the grave and the perspective of the world and taking on their ideas that, that he fulfilled messianic prophecies concerning Christ, and not, not only did he uh, uh, reinvent the law, if you will, through him, that he became our living sacrifice forever. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9 that he, that he is the petitioning one now. He is the lamb that was slain. He, he is our sacrifice. And that we come to him because of who he is. And Jesus changes the world still today for a few reasons. Number one, because he is God. John 10, 30. Look at how much trouble they had with this. I and the Father are one. Again, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many great miracles from the Father. Which of these do you stone me? We are, not, we are not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. This was the height of blasphemy. This was, this was the worst of the worst to say that he was God. And they pick up stones 
And many even today believe and they've been told that Jesus never said he was God. Maybe some of you have heard this and have been told that Jesus did not consider himself to be God, that it was a myth, a legend, a fable, a folklore, and uh, uttered long ago after his departure from the earth. And, and over the course of generations, his, father, his followers kind of uh, embellished it and made this mythical, fanciful story that Jesus was God. But that's just not true. In fact, we, if we get our theology from movies and music more than we do the Bible, we might believe that. But the reason that we believe that Jesus Christ is is, is God is because Jesus repeatedly, emphatically, unapologetically, openly, publicly declared that he was. He said that he was God. He has the divine attributes of God. He, he is God. He has the will and the mind of God because he is God. Buddha never said he was God. Missionary friend years ago, we were a youth pastor in Oregon. He came and said, you know, I went on one of those tours when I was in India and I went into the the head of Buddha, and then we were in this head, and we were walking around because you could climb up in there. He said, you know what? There's nothing there. There's nothing there. But Buddha, as great and wise as he may have been, never said he was God. Krishna never said he was God. Confucius never said he was God. Muhammad never said he was God. No other major religious founder has ever made this claim. Jesus stands alone. And friends, this statement, this truth claim, it's true or it's false. And if it's false, Jesus is the most damnable liar in the history of the world and the greatest con artist. He's telling us to pray to him, to confess to him, to trust him, to follow him, to give him our lives, to give him our dollars, to give him our deeds, to to, to give our days to him, to give our lives to him. And if he is not God, then he is the most despicable person who's ever conned the people on planet Earth. But he is God. He claimed to be God. Jesus changes the world today as well, secondly, because he forgives sins. Mark 2, 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven. Uh Uh-oh, we get in trouble again. Verse number 6. Now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow think like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Every time we sin against people, we need their forgiveness. But it's true every time we sin against God, our Creator, against Jesus, we need His forgiveness. And with some people, you might get forgiven or you might not get forgiven. They may hold a grudge for a while or they may make you pay, like other religions. They, you have to live up to a standard and, and you have to perform a certain thing. I hung around Buddhists for a while while I was remodeling their facility pastor, yes, but I was remodeling because, you know, income was a little light. So, anyway, so I'm there, and I realize these guys are very devoted and stuff, and, and they're doing their thing, but they're doing religious penance and duty. And what I learned was, in every religious system, it's built this way, except for Christianity, they did their penance because that made them better. It, it made them more holy, if you will, to use a Christian term, but they, they had to achieve a certain level, and the more they concentrated and focused and, and meditated and ate a certain diet and and lived a certain way, this was going to make them good enough. All other religions do this. All religions do this well. They take your regrets. They take your guilt. They capitalize them by making you work for their grace. Stick to their plan. Follow their path. And Jesus simply says, I forgive you. There's no comma, I forgive you if you look really nice like Pastor Larry. I forgive you if you act good, if you go to church every Sunday. I forgive you if you if you uh, work, volunteer at the school in the United Way and, and you help the old lady across the crosswalk. I forgive you if you're just a good person. No, that is not the truth. The best person on earth can still be damned to an eternal hell because it involves relationship with Jesus. Jesus is the one. Now, this is the good news. Our sin condemns us. Jesus changes the world today because he's the only way to heaven. John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know know my Father as well. From now on, you will know him and have seen him. Jesus is exclusive. And I think we need to talk about this. I don't want to be dishonest with you. Not all religions save. 
They don't. No, no other religion saves. No, no other path leads to eternal life. Not all gods and goddesses have the same one true God. Not the, the biggest God in our culture, secular progressivism, atheism, with its great divine, undivine trinity, the unholy me, myself, and I. Uh, Jesus is exclusive. It's not universalism where there's many paths to God in, in our Seattle area. That's that's popular. There's there's many ways to God. Just don't bother me with your way. I'll get to God my own way. I don't want to hear anything. I get my theology from movies and what other people think and what I've inherited from my parents' thinking and, and what my friends have told me. So I'm just going to think, rather than read the scripture for ourselves, and, and in, our, in our area this is really popular, but I can't be a liar. I have to tell us the truth according to the scripture. I'm going to stand before God and give an account for what I speak. That's what the Bible tells me as a teacher, as someone who brings in the word. And I've got to tell you the truth. There is no salvation. There is no forgiveness of sin. There is no eternal life. There is no reconciliation with God apart from faith in Jesus. It doesn't matter how we feel about it. Our feelings don't change the facts. We believe it because he said it. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one. Jesus is not only exclusive, he's inclusive. He invites everyone, not no matter what sin you've committed, no, no matter how you're living, Jesus invites you. He, he asks you, he bids you to come as he did me many years ago. And, and notice, no matter what you've done, where you've lived, no matter your skin color, Jesus invites you. No matter how old you are, Jesus invites you. No matter what religion you have participated in, Jesus invites you. No matter what sex you think you are, uh, Jesus invites you. Whether you've been atheist or agnostic or ignorant, it doesn't matter. Jesus invites you. The door is open. It is exclusive. There is one door. His name is Jesus, but it's also inclusive. Everyone is welcome to pass through the door. Everyone is welcome to come on the narrow path. All colors, both genders, all languages, all nations, all tribes, tongues, people from all times and places, from everywhere are welcome to come to faith in Christ. He is the only way to heaven. You don't have to have a bachelor doctorate degree. You don't have to be a pastor of a church. You don't have to act really good all the time. He simply invites you because he died on the cross and he loves you. He says, I've come to bear your sin. We continue on so many times in life trying to bear our own sin and we carry it around and we try to hide it. But, you know, the relief that comes in Jesus when you can say, God, forgive me for my sin. And he washes over us with his spirit. That's the goodness of our God. Fourth, he changes the world today because he rose from the dead. Mark 8, 31 says, Then he began to preach to them, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and leaders of the law. And that he must be killed, and after three days rise again. Jesus' vindication is the resurrection. Jesus kept saying, I am God. And they said, we're struggling and straining to believe you. <coughs> and many today do the same thing. Jesus says, I'm God. I can take care of you. I, I've got your life figured out. Just follow me. Won't you just give up on your life that you have? Won't you, won't you just give up on the sin that you're living in? Why don't you just throw it all behind and just live for me? I've got your back. I love you. I came to die for you. I died for you. I'll give you my life. I'll lead you with my spirit. And people are still going, And they struggled with that then. And, and so he told them, you just wait and see. He said, I will suffer. I will die. I will be buried. And three days later, I will come back. And Jesus' resurrection was his vindication. And what did they do? They took him. They said, because you say you're God, we're going to throw you down in this pit. We're going to take you out. We're going to bring it to the whipping post. We're going to give you lashes that are going to tear the skin literally off your body. We're going we're gonna to pound you. We're going to beat you. We're going to hit you in the face. We're going to spit on you. We're going to pull the beard out of your face. We're going to put a crown of thorns on your head. We're going to nail you to a cross. Put big nails right through your hands and feet. We're going to pierce your side. We're going to kill you. And what does he do? He rises from the grave. Jesus' vindication was that he rose from the dead. And it is ours today. <laughs> Praise God. Jesus died. He was arrested. He was falsely accused. He was beaten. All of these things to ensure that he was dead. They thrust a spear 
pierced his side, puncturing his heart. All of these, they laid him in a cold tomb with a hundred pounds of wrapping and, and spices and burial things, and he broke out of the tomb. The Roman centurion was stood guard. The, the tomb was sealed with a seal. But the stone was rolled away, and he walked into town. Over the course of 40 days, he appeared to crowds, some as large as 500 people. Scripture says, all at the same time, he ate meals with them. Women who had been friends with him hugged him. One man named Thomas was doubting, and, and he said, here, put your hands in my wounds, touch my side, see if it's not really me. And in fact, he fell down and he worshipped him as God. You see, Jesus rose from the dead, and history has never been the same. A bunch of cowardly disciples who were all hiding in their rooms, wondering what was going to happen, filled with fear. They no longer feared. This is probably the greatest testament to the, res the proof of the resurrection of Jesus more than any other. These guys are willing to give their lives and to die. And they did. Because they said Jesus was God. The early church stopped worshiping on Saturday, which had been their custom from creation, beginning with the Jews. And they started worshiping on Sunday because it was the day of rose from dead and, and made all things new and Christians began taking communion remembering the body and the blood of the Lord that was shed on the cross and, and, and no one visited Jesus' grave. We, we have no idea where he's buried. He's not there. No one went to visit him. It didn't become a shrine. It didn't become a holy place of worship as is a custom with some other dead religious leaders and famous people. If you want to see Jesus' body you, you wouldn't uh, go to the tomb. You would visit with him. You would spend time with him. Have a meal with him. Listen to the Bible, him teaching the Bible. These were all things that he was doing after he rose from the grave because you couldn't go visit him in the grave anymore. He was out walking around with people. And after 40 days, Jesus is sent back to heaven, and today he's alive and well. He's ruling and reigning as King of kings and Lord of lords, and he is God. He is Savior. He is Lord. He is King, and his resurrection is his vindication. He's maker of heaven and earth. He's Alpha and Omega, the beginning and end. He's the Son of God. He's the God-man. He is our humble servant, our man of sorrows. He is the good shepherd. He is the Prince of Peace, the wonderful counselor. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the dragon slayer. He's the sinless Savior. He's the resurrection and the life. He's the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. He's the sinner's friend. He is the great high priest. He is king of kings, lord of lords. And he is the way, the truth life. No one comes to the Father. Nobody comes to heaven. Nobody goes anywhere except through Jesus. And His love is gracious. It's marvelous. It's generous. It's, it's giving. It's reaching. It's opening the door to everyone who will hear Him call out. And He's coming again as King of Kings and Lord of Lords to judge the living and the dead. Compared to the world population, only a few people expected to see Jesus' first coming. So it is now with his second. The Christians expecting his appearing a few were a few against the millions of unbelievers in the world. And from that old time preacher Leonard Ravenhill, the first time he came, he entered by a woman's womb, and no one saw him enter. The next time he comes, every eye will see him. The first time he came as a lamb, the next time he is coming as the lion of the tribe of Judah. The first time he came to redeem, the next time he's coming to reign, the first time he came to die, the next time he's going to raise the dead, the first time men ask, where is he that is born king of the Jews? The next time he is coming is the king of kings. The first time he got a crown of thorns, the next time he will, he will get a crown of glory and of gold. The first time he came in poverty to a stable, but the next time he's coming in power. The first time he came with an escort of angels, the next time it says he comes with ten thousands of his saints. The first time he came in meekness, the next time he's coming in majesty. What a beautiful Jesus that we serve, the resurrected Jesus. 